Welcome to IAQ in the Eye of the Storm, Hurricane Preparedness and Response. I'm going to be honest with you. I've heard a lot of seminars, both live and via the web, and the vast majority are filled with fluff and nonsense. That will not be the case today, I promise you. Speaking to you right now is Frank Santini. I'm the Director of Education here at Pure Air. I am a lawyer, primarily practicing in Florida for the past 10 years, and I'm recognized as a Florida super lawyer and preeminent rated by Martindale Hubble. In a nutshell, my job is to help institutional clients minimize liability. Poor and air quality, unfortunately, is often a source of liability for institutions. And by the way, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be referring to a term called IAQ throughout this webinar, uh, a short abbreviated form of indoor air quality. So that's why we do this annual seminar. So fun fact about me, I'm a former professional wrestler and I was a bad guy. I would actually come out as a bad guy lawyer in the suspenders and full kind of suit outfit. Quite frankly, because no one wanted to see me in tights. Similarly, no one wants to think about indoor air quality. We have this kind of head in the sand attitude about it for a lot of facility managers out there. But there is a way to think about it. You want to think about it in such a way that you want to avoid it. And if it does happen, how to properly deal with an indoor air quality issue. So where are we at this point today? It's September 5th, 2018. No major hurricanes have hit, with the exception of our audience members in Hawaii, and very recently, the audience members out there in Alabama and Mississippi dealing with the effects of Tropical Storm Gordon. We wish you the best of luck, by the way. Now let me be clear about the purpose of this seminar. Our focus is on indoor air quality. So we won't be covering in depth general hurricane preparedness, although some of the concepts may come up naturally. The focus here is on preparation and response as it relates to IAQ specifically. One stat that always drives it home for me is how much air we actually breathe in one day. 11,000 liters, each of us, breathes in and out in a single day. Can you imagine that? I always like to think of it in terms of bottled water. How many bottles of water do you drink a day? I mean, if you're drinking as many as you should be, probably eight or nine. 11,000, though. And we would never tolerate, in a million years, our water being filled with mold and bacteria and volatile organic compounds. And so neither should we tolerate those type of things in our air, at least above acceptable levels. Another stat that hits home for me is sick building syndrome. You know, we heard a lot about this in the 1990s, but it's still an issue. Still, as we sit here in 2018, we are on the verge of having driverless cars. Yet, one in four buildings here in the United States of America is still classified as sick by the EPA. So if you take nothing else from this seminar, take this. The primary cause of an indoor air quality issue, the vast majority of sick buildings are coming from water events, in other words, water intrusion into a building that are not properly addressed. And of course, hurricanes are the ultimate water event with the combination of sustained wind speeds and precipitation. So to talk to us about preparation for hurricanes from a mechanical systems perspective, I bring to you Dan Foster, a 35 year veteran of HVAC and maybe the most athletic 59 year old this side of the Mississippi. Now Dan, we don't have a lot of time, but can you tell me what the heck you're doing in this picture? Uh, most likely trying to avoid the mud trees and the occasional spear throwing. <laughs> and this is from uh, what you call a Spartan race, is that right? Correct. And what goes on in a Spartan race, just very quickly? Uh, running through the woods, climbing monkey bars, as you can see, throwing spears, climbing mountains, playing in the mud. You actually throw spears? Correct, yes. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Okay, so Dan, um, let's start with the obvious issue. Um, from a facility manager's perspective, preparing for a hurricane, what do, you, what do you do about the roof? 
and I don't mean just the roof itself, but you're on the roof, you're walking around, what should you be doing out there if, if you know, just in preparation in general? Well, you should take a top to bottom approach. Um, start at your roof line, um, do, get up onto the roof and do your, your pre-storm inspections as you would in your other preparations for an incoming storm is get up on the roof and reassure, be reassured that all mechanical equipment is secured. Um, and that includes panel covers, piping, ductwork, um, and secured to the proper standards. Um, prior to 1992, when Florida was hit very hard by Hurricane Andrew, and I'm sure most people are familiar with that, and in August of 92, Hurricane Andrew came on shore in the Miami Homestead area and um, created very, very severe damage, and they're still recovering from that several, several years later. Um, Pre-1992, the standards that were set for securing rooftop equipment and, and apparatuses was, was very um, slim and most likely not enforced. So after Hurricane Andrew, some very stringent standards were put in place um, by some very smart people, engineers, and basing everything what, what's happening up there on wind load. Let me interrupt you for a minute, Dan. Um, this is kind of funny. We were going over this presentation earlier today, and the, I had pulled these two particular pictures um, from the Internet. And, uh, you know, woe is me that the picture on the right actually is not, not correct. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. If you look at the picture on the left, and you can see the cable strapping where um, – this particular rooftop exhaust fan is actually mechanically fastened to the structure. And what I mean by mechanically fastened and what code calls out for mechanically fastening rooftop equipment is that it's mechanically fastened to the structure, either directly underlying the roof structure or on the roof support structure itself, which means this picture on the right shows um, a rooftop piping um, looks like gas piping that's just sitting on a stand. And if you see that stand where it's just sitting on the roof deck, that is not properly fa connected to the structure. Hmm. And uh, this would be an example of something that's properly fastened to the roof. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, now tell me a little bit about um, the air handlers themselves. If, you have, if you're a facility manager out there with rooftop air handlers, what kind of things should you be, should you be looking for ahead of a hurricane? Uh, on your rooftop equipment, whether it's chillers, rooftop air handlers, rooftop package units, number one, first and foremost, you want to make sure that all the panels are, are properly secured to the apparatus itself, which means all the screws are in place, they're, they're tight, and if, for the fact is these panels can easily, a little bit of wind can get underneath them and tear them off, and they become a, a real safety hazard projectile that becomes airborne and can, you know, cause serious bodily damage to somebody wherever it ends up. So uh, first and foremost that it's secured and then that the, the entire um, unit itself is properly and mechanically secured to the structure like we were discussing. Okay. Um, now, uh, I was talking to another one of our building science folks here in the office um, and he mentioned he wanted me to talk about parapet walls. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. A lot of folks out there uh, with facilities have parapet um, and, uh, and flashing. So tell us a little bit about that and what you do to prepare for a hurricane in that respect. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes the obvious potential damage can be overlooked. So in, in regards to the parapet walls, you're talking about a flashing on top of a, a decorative wall you usually see on the front or the sides of a building. It's that little portion of a wall, two, three feet high that uh, sits at the roof line and there's a metal flashing that is on top and it needs to be just like a an air piece of air conditioning equipment mechanically secured to the structure if it is not it's easily ripped off by the high winds and once ha what happens after that is your roof membrane um, gets exposed the edges get exposed the wind can get under it and completely pull the membrane off your roof and then you have some real serious issues mm -hmm. and that's when you're going to start seeing you know, the indoor, the IAQ assessment teams come in because you're going to have some serious water damage. Okay, yeah. You know, the reason I want to emphasize that is because our director of building sciences asked me to 
really tell the audience that that's a big deal. So you, you have parapets out there, really take a close look uh, at the wall caps or flashing, because that we feel that in our experience of doing this for 30 years that, that that's a big source of issues um, when, when there's when the, when, the, when there's a way for for wind and precipitation to get in there. Um, so let's talk about preparation in the sense of you know a hurricanes coming, Dan, and um, you know you want to make sure you're ready in all respects. Uh, you know, if you, if you lose power or if, if you lose um, the ability to use some of your HVAC systems, tell, talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, these, civil, these severe storms and even the minor storms can cause damage to your property to, that can actually um, interrupt your business, interrupt your revenue stream. Um, and so it's highly important that um, you avoid the water intrusion, which easily includes fresh air makeup dampers on units. Um, we all know that driving rain can drive sideways during these storms and it's gonna penetrate areas that typically do not have any water penetration. So saying that, to avoid that uh, critical shutdown of your business or your facility, whether it be healthcare, um, that it's important that incorporated into your disaster planning is preparation when it comes to critical areas, getting back online, um, air conditioning wise, uh, it's typically very uh, hot and humid after these storms pass for several days. So if you're gonna have your um, employees in the building working, they're gonna need some comfort cooling. So plan for and reach out to the disaster, the companies that provide disaster rentals. You never know um, when critical pieces of outdoor equipment are gonna be damaged and you should have a plan in place to bring in some sort of temporary apparatus to get you back in business. Now, I might be messing this word up, Dan, but you said something about steel phalanges with respect to ch temporary chillers. Is, am, I, am I saying that right? You uh, are, uh, and I see this all the time, is people will have part of their disaster plan, they'll have a rental um, company in place to deliver them a piece of equipment, but if they don't have the means to quickly connect that piece of equipment, um, which means temporary emergency flanges to connect a chilled water system, um, trailer mounted is you very well could wait for several days to have something very simple installed that you could have had done ahead, ahead of time. Um, so that's, that's what that's all about. Okay. Um, do you, uh, we also talked about in terms of another item of preparation, everybody talks about generators and all that, but you know, having rental companies, these companies who provide uh, this temporary HVAC equipment on call, so that if, if you have you know if you can arrange a financial arrangement with them, so that you're you're one of the first folks they're seeing if you need some temporary uh, HVAC equipment. That that is correct. Yeah. So um, obviously not everybody's in that position, but if if you're obviously you're in a hospital or healthcare, that's a, that's obviously a very important point uh, to keep the the line of communication open with um, these HVAC temporary. Uh, uh, rental companies. So let's talk about after the storm, Dan. Uh, what do we do? The storm comes, it hits. Um, you know, are we, you know what, what's our first reaction after, after we can go outside finally? First reaction is typically, you know, I want my power back on, I want to be back in business, and I want my air conditioning back on in the building. Um, it's, it's way too reactive. Um, basically what you should be doing is rinse and repeat what you did before the storm. Get up, do your visual inspection um, before power is restored. Make sure there's no damage up there. Uh, I've seen a very large facility that after a tropical storm came through, destroyed almost every drain line on their roof. They were in a hurry. They turned all their units back on. So what they had is a disaster after the disaster. The entire facility was flooded just from condensate from the air conditioning systems, which is easily avoided with a post-storm inspection. Um, and one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, Dan, is uh, you said something about the buildings being under, under negative pressure in the context of water intrusion. Talk to us a little bit about that before you head out. Well, because of our, our air quality standards that um, we have these days is we're infusing a lot of fresh air into the building um, because we want to keep it either on a slight positive pressure or almost a neutral pressure. 
Um, if you're running on the negative side, what happens is cracks, crevices, areas that um, will be pulling in water intrusion into your facility. Um, so it's important that that's one of the aspects of your building envelope that you should check regularly. Awesome, Dan. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to keep it right on moving here. Uh, we have next up, we have Carl Steffen, is a certified industrial hygienist and avid fisherman. Carl, you know, I was surprised. We had lunch last week, and the passion and knowledge with which you were speaking about fishing was astounding to me. I didn't know you had such a background in indoor and outdoor environmental sciences. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sir. I uh, graduated from the Pennsylvania State University uh, with a, a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries science. And then uh, my master's degree is actually in environmental sciences. So I've, uh, I've had a wide range of uh, classwork and on-site experience related to uh, indoor and outdoor environments and seeing the similarities and uh, some differences, of course, but a lot of similarities and overlap. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, Carl's one of our building scientists, and he is, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to change the PowerPoint, but there's a picture of him. What, what kind of fish is that, Carl? As a redfish. <laughs> uh, did you get to eat? Is that something you eat or no? I'm a pretty big catch and release fisherman. Okay. Um, I occasionally keep fish, but yeah, that's a redfish I put back. Also here with us is Ronnie, the Traveler of Rock. He is um, our quality assurance manager in our lab. And Ronnie, um, it's kind of a tight fit we have here, but you can lean over here and tell us about the coolest trip you ever had. Uh, the coolest trip that comes to my mind is when I was a child, I went to Petra uh, in Jordan. It was really cool going through, you know, looking at all the buildings in the mountains and, you know, the desert heat and everything like that. But uh, that's probably my coolest trip that I've been on. Fantastic. Well, we'll get right to it now. So what um, Carl does, um, and Carl obviously is a building scientist, he's out there and his, his basic role is he's like a doctor slash private investigator for buildings. He's going out there and figuring out what's going on uh, when you have a building that might be, has a problem or in the sense of a doctor who's out there trying to do, be like a, doing checkups for buildings to make sure they're preventing any problems from, from occurring. Is there anything you want to add to that, Carl? No, I mean, that's, that's the goal. Um, there's so many different components and variables in buildings. Um, you can't necessarily just walk in and make any assumptions that it's one thing or there's no interactions or anything that might cause an escalation in the problem. So you do have to go in there uh, and almost play detective, which is exciting for us, but it's also very important that you do that. You look for uh, various problems and how they interact. Great. Well, I want to talk, you know, start, start kind of uh, relaxed here and talk about a simple concept, and that is um, uh, points of intrusion in the buildings, the ways for water to get in. And one thing that you pointed out to me, which I didn't know, which is, seems, seems obvious if you think about it, is pests create a lot of points of intrusion in the buildings. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, well, we have a, a combination of things. Um, sometimes, you know, certain items we talked about flashing earlier, for example, I've seen plenty of cases where it's just not properly installed the first time. It gets overlooked. Um, you know, we, we know that mice can squeeze down the size of almost a quarter to get into a, a building or through a hole. Um, various other insects uh, easily with even smaller diameter access can, can wake their way into the building. Um, pests coming in and out, you know, they will also, mice can cause a lot of damage to the materials that are in place um, to at gain that access to the building. But once you have those openings, the pests that come in and out, not only can they contribute allergens from their bodies and, and break down and once they die in the building, but they have feces. And these are known uh, allergens that people can react to. And uh, the problem is once these pests start to make their way in and out and create these openings, those openings now serve also as uh, moisture intrusion points. Hmm. What, are, what are some other tips you can give the audience about um, preventing or reacting to moisture intrusion points um, in this context? I mean, you know, you guys kind of hinted upon a lot of the areas of, of concern earlier, but we have to remember, especially down here in the southeast United States and the Florida sun, uh, over time a lot of our uh, materials can break down and, de and degrade. And what happens is if we overlook that and we don't, or as a facilities manager, you're not kind of keeping a, an eye on things or doing a, a yearly checkup, uh, these areas where they degrade can then serve as air and or moisture intrusion points, uh, you know, related to a hurricane, just thinking about uh, 
around windows, we have caulking. You know, give that a few years in the hot sun, that starts to crack and degrade. And now, uh, during a, a strong wind-driven event with, with plenty of precipitation, um, that can provide a perfect access point. We have uh, a flashing over time as well, doorways. So it's, it's a good idea to basically, uh, before every hurricane season especially, go around your building and, and check and look for these little areas uh, that you may not typically look at um, the rest of the year and just see, does this, does this opening seem like it might be a, a source for moisture intrusion? Does something look different or damaged in those areas? And, you know, while we're on that point, and I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Carl, but, <clears throat> you know, there's so many potential projectiles out there. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the things that our director of building sciences told me before we came out here was, just get the crap off your roof. If you're storing unused equipment up there or, or just anything that doesn't have to be on your roof, get it off your roof. Um, same, same goes with, you know, simple things like plants and potters. Get them out of there. Um, you know, everybody advises this, but don't forget, trim, trim your trees away from your roof. That's a, that's a simple thing to keep in mind. Anything that, you know, Carl's talking about, you know, intrusion points created by pests and, and the sun, but don't forget, you can create intrusion points through projectiles. So be aware of that and do what you can um, in terms of removing potential projectiles from your roof and from the exterior of the building. So, Carl, let's talk about during the storm. You, you had an interesting story you told me a couple of days ago about one of our clients who was really on top of things during the storm um, in, ter in terms of having a real, real good teamwork. Um, so keep, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd responded to a call um, in which water was observed migrating down a dividing wall uh, throughout the hurricane. The maintenance staff, uh, they had kind of prepared in the sense that they had five or six individuals prepared ahead of time as part of a plan to be in the building to address issues as they occurred. Uh, this paid off substantially for them for the description they gave me with the amount of uh, moisture intrusion that occurred. They were capturing it uh, even <laughs> You know, not just mops and, and towels, but they were rushing trash cans to the areas where the water was collecting, capturing it and draining it as fast as possible. What they actually ended up doing, um, and it was confirmed from not only a visual sampling, but air sampling clearance on the first go, uh, they allowed for the building material to dry pretty quickly right after um, the hurricane stopped. And they did have a plan in place. They had uh, a generator present. They were able to continue to run the air conditioning system. So they were kind of keeping their humidity low. They were keeping their, their drying effect uh, relatively good. Um, but at the same time, they were removing that moisture and stopping it from pooling up or collecting, which is usually the big problem. As we start to let moisture accumulate in an area, it's going to saturate building materials, uh, especially porous ones such as drywall. And we know that you know, we need to have, as the EPA points out, between 24 to 48 hours after a building materials are getting wet, uh, you should be starting the drying process or materials should be pretty much dried out uh, toward the latter half of that. Before we get into post-hurricane stuff, Carl, one, one more question mm -hmm. about, uh, you mentioned something about drainage when we were talking earlier. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, you know, drainage is another issue. Um, drainage and gutters, I mean, you spoke earlier about trimming the trees back and the roof. Uh, you know, a lot of times we overlook the gutter system, and when you start getting uh, a heavy concentration of precipitation, uh, that's going to back up drainage lines. It's going to, if your gutters are clogged up, that water is going to accumulate quickly, and then it's going to look for the path of least resistance, which could bring it towards your building and into areas where it can intrude into the building. Um, these areas usually don't pop up during our passing thunderstorm or an occasional day of rain, but when you get this heavy event, um, that's when this, this small item that you overlook could become uh, pretty catastrophic for you. We also look at the sloping away from the building. Um, it's not always an easy fix, but to understand where your, you know, your susceptible areas are with drainage and uh, sloping at the building and prepare accordingly for that. Great. Now, now let's talk about after the storm, Carl. Obviously, um, that, that's a big part of your job is dealing with the after effects of uh, water intrusion into a building. Uh, so why don't you and Ronnie walk us through what needs to be done. The storm's happened, um, you've done the best you can, but you've had water intrusion in the building. What steps do you take to try to minimize the impact? 
Right. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, the goal is to, uh, again, as the EPA points out, have a dry between 24 and 48 hours, uh, at least be on or into the drying process at that 24 to 48 hour mark. Um, the more you can uh, dry up materials faster, the better chance you have of preventing uh, potential mold growth, which as we exceed that 48 hours, that's when we really start to get into that critical point where the mold growth uh, can start to establish and, and become you know, prevalent. Now, Ron, you, you commented to me that you know, beyond the 24 to 48 hours, you get to a point where you have a, another level of mold growth. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, in our laboratory, when we're trying to culture the organisms, we give them um, bacteria about two to three days and fungi about five to seven days. And the reason for that is so that we can allow it to develop. Um, as Carl was saying here, that 24 to 48 hours, you may see mold growth, um, and it could be possible for it to start, but it doesn't really s mature until you hit about you know that four, five, uh, six, seven day uh, mark. And at that point, it can really get into building materials, and it can uh, mature into developing spores. And you definitely don't want the spores um, you know being released within an indoor environment. Um, and you can see on the slide. Um, It'll allow it to spread, it'll allow it to proliferate into um, further parts of the building materials. Um, so that's why, you know, especially within that 24 to 48 hours, you want it to be dry. Um, mold and bacteria love moist or damp or, you know, dark areas. Um, and obviously after a very big hurricane, um, that can cause a lot of issues. So scenario here, Carl, Ronnie, uh, let's say for whatever reason, you were not able to do anything in the first two or three days after a hurricane about the water intrusion. Um, you know, and some couple of days have gone by. What do you, what do, you do? What's, what can you do after, at that point? I mean, it's at that point, you want to get in your building. You want to use your eyes and your nose. Um, they're great tools to use to walk around, inspect, see what areas reveal itself as maybe building materials are starting to stain or they're saturated. Uh, maybe you detect mold growth, something doesn't smell quite right, something doesn't look quite right. Uh, identify those areas, get a floor plan out, write them down, start to mark them, and at that point, try to contact a professional, uh, somebody that can come in and utilize what you've provided them with, um, or you can do a walkthrough and take care of the problem by not only testing, but I, you know, confirming, identifying the areas, and pulling together a plan to correct those problems. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, what happens after a hurricane often, all the relevant contractors are getting gobbled up by the, by, 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 with, with tremendous amounts of work. So let's say you can't get uh, a, a specialist out there, um, or, you know, you're fifth in the list. What, 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 what can you do yourself? Right. Um, oftentimes, you know, you, you may get a, a pretty good indication of where the source of moisture came from. If you're able to do that uh, at that point, identify that source and make preparations to correct it. Uh, you don't want to leave it go. It's probably only been made worse by the moisture event, the hurricane itself. So now if you get a thunderstorm or something a couple days later, that may just continue to provide a source for moisture to come into the building. And until you correct that source, you're just going to continually either worsen the situation or uh, have a better chance of leading to mold growth or other. But, uh, you know, one of the things you can do, too, is as you walk through your buildings, you're noticing things, try to have a plan in place um, to start dehumidifying the building. Uh, you know, as we spoke, or as you guys were discussing earlier, having a plan where you have certain equipment uh, ready already, or if you have a plan where you can get it delivered to you uh, following that event, uh, that's that's ideal because the number one thing is if you have the moisture sitting in your materials and you can get dehumidification going, you're going to remove that moisture from the building quickly. Um, and that's that's what you know I would say as as one of the number one goals: start drying the building, get the moisture out of there, have your plan in place such that you're able to acquire the equipment to do so. If if you had to pick the two most important things, obviously there's a lot of factors go into it. Would you say the most important things are drying and de and dehumidification? Um, when I say drying, I mean getting the water out of there and also dehumidifying the uh, the space. Yeah, I'd say you know get yeah getting the water out of there to the best of your ability, but also identifying 
areas that might have been compromised, you know, structurally or that are developing mold. Um, if you can't get anybody out there, and maybe you do have a small area that, you know, kind of shows some potential growth, some mold, um, consider the rough square footage, per se. Um, we know that around 10 square feet or under, um, you can usually handle that yourself using, obviously, proper protection uh, and protocols. But one, one thing to consider is EPA provides uh, a lot of free documentation and guidelines that will help you identify what you can and what you probably shouldn't do, uh, what you should do in terms of personal protection, uh, products you can use, and, and kind of do it yourself for, for getting rid of those contaminated or suspicious areas. Um, because it's one thing to remove the moisture and to dry, but if you have a contaminated material, as Ryan was saying earlier, the longer it sits there, it might have a chance to grow, it might have a chance to spread. Tell us about, you, you talked to me about uh, these places where microbials really, really proliferate, like dirty carpets. Tell me a little bit about that. Right, so, um, you know, we, we notice a lot of times when we go out to do these investigations, people are able to identify areas in the drywall, ceiling tiles, um, but we sometimes overlook the carpets. Uh, I just always hear, oh, water got on the carpet, but it, it looks fine now. And lo and behold, you know, I'll use some thermal imaging equipment and see that, no, it's actually pretty, pretty well saturated still in, in certain areas. Um, generally, the carpet will dry in some areas better than others. And the problem we face is those areas that haven't dried have now been saturated for, you know, a week, maybe more. And that's just asking for, uh, allowing for microbial proliferation. Now, when we're talking about microbial pro proliferation, what are we talking about specifically? What kind of organisms? Well, we're talking about fungi and bacteria. And, um, you know, obviously we, we're going to talk a lot about mold today, uh, but I want to also not forget about bacteria because a lot, this kind of goes, everybody talks about mold in buildings. But, Ron, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about bacteria and, and why it's so important to address it as a problem? Um, with bacteria, it's going to grow in a lot of similar conditions as fungi. Um, you see, we were just talking about carpet specifically that will contain things like, um, you know, animal or human hair, if you have anything like that, you know, especially deeper carpets, it'll trap skin cells, it'll uh, trap any other, you know, dirt or debris. And that, it's, uh, it serves as a nutrition um, for these organisms, and it'll allow them to proliferate. And as Carl was saying, you know, you think that you may have cleaned up uh, or, you know, taken out the moisture from that kind of source, but you find out that it's actually been wet that whole time. And as I was saying earlier, um, those mo moist environments really help the bacteria and fungi grow, um, especially if they become airborne, um, can really affect your indoor air, can affect, um, you know, the air that you're breathing, mm. and it can cause you a lot of problems as well. Interesting. Now, <clears throat> kind of switching gears here, but everybody out there always fears this black mold. Is there only... Like what, what is black mold? Is, is there just one kind of black mold? Tell us a little bit about that, guys. Well, when it comes to black mold, um, it's kind of a group of uh, fungi. Um, there's a few of them. The most popular ones are Stachybotrys and Fusarium. Um, typically, those are considered, they're called toxic black, black molds because they... Um, generate a toxin, uh, mycotoxins or um, aflatoxins, ochratoxins. Um, they actually produce a byproduct that can cause, you know, harm to people, you know, even healthy individuals. Whereas sometimes you'll see, you know, we've had plenty of customers send us in samples saying, oh, you know, I'm scared this is black mold. It's, you know, I have these black spots on my walls or, um, you know, wherever they may be seeing them. Then we find out it's just a more common thing like Cladosporium or Aspergillus or Penicillium. And while those can definitely still cause, you know, health problems, it's not so much in healthy individuals. It's typically with immunocompromised or, you know, um, individuals who are sensitive to those ones. Um, while they look black, they're not what we consider the typical toxic black mold that, you know, you hear about in the media all the time. Now, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing, I always heard the term mycotoxin um, that's released by, you know, dangerous mold, but you also mentioned something called aflatoxin? Yeah. yeah. So mycotoxin is a group of um, toxins. Um, you know, here in our laboratory, we actually test specifically for what's called trichothecenes, mm. um, but 
there's things like T2 trichotillomeres, um, H2, and those are all encompassed by mycotoxins. Then you have the other ones that are essentially the same thing. It's just groups of these toxins um, made by these certain fungi. You know, Stachybotrys mm -hmm. might make mycotoxin, whereas you know Fusarium could be making the aflatoxin or the ochratoxin or things like that. Interesting. Okay, um, we're we're starting to run out of time here. I wanted to talk about the importance of early expert intervention here and ter after you've had a water event after a hurricane. Uh, because, you know, we talked about the fact that you can get mold or bacteria uh, growing in your carpet, growing in your drywall. But uh, to me, the worst case scenario is uh, when it gets into the HVAC system. Um, so tell us about that, Carl. How does that happen and what needs to be done about it? Well, as Ronnie said earlier, we, when we get calls and we're coming out, you know, a week, two weeks after the event, um, the problem we have is, at this point, the fungi could have matured. Um, now they're able to sporulate. They're able to aerosolize much easily, or much more easily. And the problem you have is if there's a disturbance in those particulates, those aerosols get into the air stream, they could then migrate into the HVAC system. They'll get their light. Um, they're able to be uh, or transported into the return, um, leading back to the HVAC system, where they could then mix with the supply air and get redistributed through the building. And, you know, if your HVAC system has issues with uh, bypass, maybe the filters are, are an issue, even if the hurricane might have caused damage to your HVAC and now allowed for that return air to bypass um, right into the airstream uh, or the supply airstream, uh, you have the ability now to uh, contaminate the rest of the building. So it's a, that's a big issue that we see every time um, there is a water event in the building that we're concerned about that. Um, if, if things are properly addressed, um, it, it can be avoided, but um, it's very important because obviously you have, a, you have what could be an isolated problem turn into a building-wide problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, right. great. Um, so, to, I want to just run through a couple, couple things about, uh, there's a couple pictures of some AV, HVAC systems from our, our files. Um, I want to just talk a couple quick things about legal issues. And guys, um, you guys can hang out if you want, but I appreciate you coming. Um, uh, I'm talking with Coral and Ronnie here. So, you know, just a couple quick things. So legal issues are, are my expertise as a former attorney. Um, we, you know, we, we're seeing an uptick in particularly mold lawsuits being brought against institutions and organizations in the last couple of years. So just be aware that it's becoming more of a, uh, more of a uh, attractive um, type of lawsuit for the uh, plaintiff's attorneys out there who are looking for some easy money from uh, the local uh, organization with a big insurance policy. So um, not only with dealing with a health issue, but it potentially could be a legal issue for folks out there um, who don't properly address these water events uh, inside their buildings after hurricanes. Um, obviously, the implication to me is I get, you know, think about the a potential nightmare of being cross-examined by a, you know, a hotshot plaintiff's attorney. It's not something no one ever wants to be involved in um, and, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, let me just wrap it up by talking about Pure Air Control Services as a company. Uh, we are 35-year-old uh, indoor air quality specialists. Um, Ronnie here is from our uh, environmental lab, uh, which has uh, been around since 1994, and we do indoor air quality analysis. Uh, we're CDC elite, um, and we have uh, examined over a quarter million samples in the course of our 25-year uh, uh, laboratory history. Um, and the lab is led by Dr. Rajiv Sahai, Sahai who is a, a certified aerobiologist, PhD. Um, and of course, Carl here is a member of our building science team, which, uh, as we talked about earlier, is like our IAQ detectives, right, Carl? Right. Um, so they do a lot of forensic investigations and screening of buildings uh, to, to identify problems and, 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 and recommend solutions, almost like going to the doctor and getting a prescription. Um, and of course, we also have our, our remediation division. And our, our, our remediation division focuses specifically on uh, HVAC hygiene. Uh, we're talking about cleaning of air handlers, uh, hygienic cleaning of ductwork. Also, we do mold remediation, which is, you know, if worst case scenario, you've had a water event, you, you do have mold in, in your drywall or inside your building, we go in there as certified mold remediation specialists and go out there and we get the mold out of there. Uh, so let me 
let me just mention too our pure steam process where we actually go in there with high temperature low pressure steam um, and do a full environmental cleaning of air handlers um, and this is something we've been we have a really really uh, well regarded process throughout the country on this it's a green certified process uh, and we have a, a numerous case studies showing the efficacy of using a pure steam process in air handlers not only for the hygiene purposes in terms of reducing these microbials we talked about mold uh, all the types of fungi bacteria but also increasing efficiency because you're able to uh, get better airflow across the coil and get more uh, be able to reach temperature set point more efficiently and your systems run more efficiently when you have a, a much cleaner coil from the steam. Uh, there's a couple of examples there. And of course, oh, by the way, Harvard's one of our clients and Florida State has been one of our clients for a long time and we'll also do an HVAC New Life process. HVAC New Life is a, a process where we refurbish and restore aging air handlers. Um, and it's, and we've been doing this for a number of years and clients are just ecstatic about the, about the uh, uh, results of it, being able to save tons of money by instead of having to replace the box, replacing the air handler, actually restoring the air handler to a hygienically clean condition um, and, and, and spending a lot less money doing it. And there's a couple example pictures there, uh, drain pans um, and, and, and things like that. We usually typically cost about a tenth of the, the cost to restore the air handler through our HVAC new life process as it does to, um, to replace it. And then finally, a uh, big part of our process is cleaning the ductwork. Uh, this is what we're worried about after a hurricane uh, of mold spores and bacteria getting into the ductwork, getting into the air handlers. Uh, so we have a, uh, we're nationally, National Air, Air Duct Cleaning Association certified to go in there and clean ductwork. And we did, we did a lot of this kind of work after the hurricane last year, not only from the pure steam process for air handlers, but also throughout ductwork systems to go in there and sanitize, return and supply ductwork in various types of buildings, whether it's a government building, a school district building, a university, hospitals, things of that nature. I'll make a small comment about Pure Decon. This is a program to use a hydrogen peroxide silver mist to completely sanitize occupied spaces. We, we do this very often after we do uh, duct cleaning or mold remediation. Uh, it's a nice icing on the cake uh, after you've gone through and sanitized the room through topical cleaning or mold remediation. This, uh, uh, aeros uh, this spray that uh, sprays throughout the room touches all surfaces and really does a great job of killing very difficult to kill organisms like C. diff, for example. So I'll wrap up by saying this, you know, the worst part about IAQ, the worst part, the part you, the place you don't want to be is, is where you have a building that's got a stigma. People just believe there's a problem with the building. In our experience, that doesn't have to happen. If you address issues right away, don't let them fester. You know, if somebody's complaining, go find out what the source of the complaint is right away. Then they'll start to see, okay, we have a facilities team that's on top of things. They're going to be, uh, we're not worried about old issues inside the building that are going to cause a health issue. Because we see stigmas develop even after buildings have been thoroughly clean and sanitized, the HVAC system, the occupied spaces. We see after a while, because they let, things were let go for so many years, the folks, the employees inside that building just believe in their mind that there's a problem. So avoid that. Avoid the unknown by addressing problems proactively, or if there is a problem, address it you know, with ex early expert intervention. So they don't have your employees start to, develop, start to think of a building as having a stigma. You'll, be, you'll have happier employees. You'll have actually have more productive employees. We didn't even cover this, but there's a lot of studies out there talking about the productivity of employees, how much it increases with better indoor air quality. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we, we hope that we accomplished our goal, which was to educate folks and give them at least some take-home pointers about how to prepare for and react to a hurricane or water event in, in, the, in the context of indoor air quality. Thank you. Have a great day.